about 115 years ago, and not too far from where we are right now, just to the east of the Forbidden City. There's a little, there's a little hutong called uh, the Shila Hutong, and there was uh, um, uh, a very important political figure and scholar living there named Wang Yiro. And the story is that he was, he was suffering from malaria and sent out uh, to get some dragon bones to cure his malaria. But he told the person not to grind, not to have the, uh, the drugstore grind up the dragon bones, but rather to bring them back and he would grind them himself. When they brought them back, this uh, Wang Yirong was a collector of bronze vessels and he was uh, uh, aware of the inscriptions on the insides of bronze vessels from about 1000 BC, maybe even a little before that. When he saw these dragon bones that were brought back to him with writing on him, he recognized that this writing was very similar to the writing on the bronze inscript, uh, on the bronze vessels that he knew, but that he identified it as an even earlier form of the language. And then he went out and, uh, and bought all of the dragon bones that he could find in, in Beijing at the time. There are other stories as well that maybe maybe the dragon bones actually were identified already and uh, by by a scholar in Tianjin, but the story about Wang Yirong is so romantic that it uh, uh, it is worth telling again. Uh, it didn't cure Wang Yirong's malaria, or at least he didn't have enough time to let it do its magic. Uh, because in the, so it was in 1899 that he discovered these. Um, in 1900, right after the Boxer Rebellion was suppressed, he committed suicide. So he probably was still suffering from the malaria, but uh, but he claimed the suicide was because of his role in uh, in leading the uh, the Chinese army against the Boxers and, and in support of the Boxers. Um, but his collection of, of oracle bones, about 3,000 pieces, was then bought and published in 1903. And people very quickly identified these as coming from the Shang Dynasty, so before the Zhou Dynasty that Ian mentioned. Um, and these date to roughly about 1200 BC. And it, as soon as this book was published, it set off a frenzy to try and find the source of these dragon bones. And within six years, it had been traced back to Anyang, which is a city about, uh, about 500 miles to the south of Beijing. And particularly in Anyang, uh, there, were, there was one area that produced most of these, most of these bones that Peasants were digging out of the soil. And uh, in, in many ways, the discovery of these oracle bones and the continual digging through the teens, through the, the first two decades of the 20th century, led after the establishment of the Republic of China to the, the first institute of science in China which was the Academia Sinica in Taiwan, and the Institute of Academia Sinica that was charged with, um, with the study of things like oracle bone inscriptions was called the Institute of History and Philology. And it's still functioning in Taiwan today. And their very first project was the excavation of Anyang looking for the context of these oracle bones. Uh, they started in 1928 with formal excavations that continued for uh, 16 seasons, but eight years through 1936. An archaeological season is spring and autumn. They tend to stay home in the summer when it's hot and in the winter when it's cold. They say it's because they have to take their materials back to the office and, and work on them and write their reports. Um, but the, the very first project, 
that Academia Sinica launched was the excavation of Anyang. And what they found was a, a major bronze-using civilization. At the time, it was fairly popular to say that Chinese bronzes had come from the West and much of Chinese civilization had been imported from the West. But when the archaeologist demonstrated that there was a, a, a context in which the bronzes developed indigenously, then the notion of Chinese civilization being imported almost lock, stock, and barrel from the West was, uh, uh, was refuted rather decidedly. Perhaps even a little too decidedly, because there were things that were coming from the West, from uh, areas that Chicago colleagues study in the ancient Near East, but we won't talk about those tonight. Um, the piece on the right is one of these turtle shells um, that is interesting to look at. It looks like a turtle. It looks like the underbelly of a turtle. And this is one of the earliest um, complete, well, it's not complete, one of the earliest turtle shells that we know of, really from right around 1200 BC. So the Shang Dynasty, the, the period of the Shang Dynasty that produced these inscribed turtle shells and also ox bones, the scapula bones of oxen, um, dates from 1200 to about 1050 BC. So this is right near the beginning of that 150 year period. But um, there's an interesting story about that piece. It looks like it's complete except for one little piece right there that's missing. Um, in fact, if you could read this down here, it's, it's very small and it's also a little bit cut off. Uh, there are 13 different accession numbers. Um, this was found on June the 12th, 1936. It was the last day of excavation uh, in that year. Once again, the, the, the seasons are spring and autumn, so they were just concluding, and they found this refuse pit. They opened it up, and it was full of little pieces of turtle shell. Um, they claimed that the Japanese army was on the move in North China so that they needed to get out of town quickly. And they didn't want to stay in Anyang to excavate. I, I sort of suspect it was too hot, but uh, uh, the story goes then that they dug the entire pit out of the ground, put it on a railroad car, and shipped it to, uh, to Nanjing, which was the capital and where the institute offices were. They started um, cleaning the pieces there at the Institute in Nanjing. But of course, in the very next year, the Japanese army made it to southern China. And the Institute then had to relocate to western China to Kunming. They took these pieces with them to Kunming in various crates. Turned out there were 17,000 pieces of turtle shell. Um, when the war ended, they shipped these turtle shells back to Nanjing, where they photographed them in 1947. They didn't have much time to study them because then another war broke out, and the Institute decided to relocate to Taiwan, taking its treasures with it, and among those treasures were the turtle shells. Uh, they arrived in Taiwan, in the 1950s, scholars in Taiwan decided that it, if you have a little piece of turtle shell with a couple of graphs on it, it's not going to inform you very much about the context of that inscription. But if you can put a complete turtle shell back together again, it actually found a couple of complete turtle shells with inscriptions not quite as numerous as on this piece. But if they could put it back together again, they'd have a better context. And through the 1950s and the early 1960s, 
in the offices in uh, in Nangang, which at that time was outside of Taipei, now it's part of Taipei, um, they actually had students from a girls' high school who were putting these back together again almost as jigsaw puzzles. And this particular piece was put together from 13 different pieces. And now we can read the entire, uh, there, there are about 20 different inscriptions on it. They're um, divinations, uh, and divinations we tend to think are questions about the future. What is going to happen in the future? In fact, in ancient China, divination was never a question about what's going to happen in the future. After all, if you, if you ask that, how are you going to get the turtle to give you a proper answer to it? Um, in fact, what divination in ancient China was uh, always was a form of prayer a statement of what we wish will happen in the future. And so we, we would have something that um, uh, the king uh, will go on campaign and will defeat the enemy. Okay? Or uh, a request that the spirits will aid in, in this. Uh, in fact, this inscription right here, which is um, obviously the most important inscription on this particular piece, is about a, a battle that's about to take place. And uh, the, the divination proper says that we're going to attack in five days, we're going to attack a foreign state. But the king reads the crack and says, we ought not to attack on the fifth day. We ought to wait until the tenth day. And then there's actually a, a post facto verification that's added to this as well, that on that 10th day, they did, did attack and they did in fact defeat the, uh, the enemy. When we have verifications, they, surprisingly enough, always verify the king's prognostication. He's never wrong. Uh, I'm sure he was wrong on occasion, but nobody wrote it down. Uh, so. This is, this is um, something that, that launched the, the, the new study of Chinese antiquity um, that in a major way uh, brought archaeology into the, the world view of modern China. In fact, in 1949, after these had moved to Taiwan, after these uh, turtle shells had moved to Taiwan. Anyang was the very first site in China that was named a national monument and uh, a, a site to be preserved. And in China, it's the uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, or now the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, that has an institute of archaeology, and they have had a station uh, situated in Anyang, and excavations have continued from 1949 until the present. And I haven't been back to Anyang in 25 years, I regret to say, but I'm told that there, there are fascinating new museums there. there. There's actually important excavation work going on even, even now. Um, but this is all about China. So the rebirth of China, the, uh, uh, the subtitle for the talk is Archaeology and Chinese Studies at the University of Chicago. So what is it about the University of Chicago that uh, is worth talking about in this regard? And uh, Ian mentioned that I am the, the Lorraine J. and Hurley G. Creel professor. This is Hurley Creel. Um, you, you mentioned that there was a program in Chinese studies uh, in the 1920s. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't encountered that, except that Creel, Creel was a, an undergraduate at the university. Uh, he got a, a BA in 1926, an MA in 1928, and his PhD in 1929. Took 
graduate students much less time to get PhDs in those days. Uh, he, of course, they didn't have to learn Chinese, even if they were doing Chinese studies, uh, because there was, there was no one teaching Chinese at the university at the time. He was in the divinity school, but learned uh, basically by reading French works on China. Uh, in 1930, he, 1929, when he graduated, he spent a year teaching in one of the western suburbs of Chicago. And then in 1930, he got a Rockefeller Foundation fellowship to go to Harvard to actually begin his study of Chinese. And then in 1932, the Rockefeller Foundation gave him more money to go to China itself. And he was in, in Beijing from 1932 until 1936. Uh, I was hoping that I would have a picture of Hurley Creel visiting Anyang. We have a, one of the last slides I'll show you is a colleague who is today arriving in Chicago. And he's coming from Academia Sinica in Taiwan where they have a, a fabulous photo archive. And he has shown me pictures that they have of Hurley Creel in Anyang in 1933, but they weren't published yet, and so he couldn't let me have a copy. Uh, but um, Creel made a couple of visits to Anyang. Indeed, he even uh, purchased some oracle bones. We have 42 oracle bones that he uh, eventually donated to the university there in the Smart Museum. Um, so that makes us uh, probably the second largest collection of oracle bones in an American university. There are a couple of other collections that are larger in, in other institutions, but Columbia has, uh, has about 90 oracle bones. We have 42. Uh, Princeton Princeton may have a, a few more, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, he was here in Beijing for four years. And uh, during his time in Beijing, he was writing these studies in early Chinese culture. And he said that he then got an offer from the University of Chicago to come back and teach there and to begin a program in Chinese language and Chinese civilization. But friends of his looked at this book that he was writing, and this was published actually in 1937, um, and said, this is all well and good, but no one will ever read it. It's entirely too technical. And uh, so he decided to write a popular book and it was published before the studies in early Chinese civilization, The Birth of China. And you can see what my skills with a PowerPoint are here. Um, it, I actually have a scanner in my office, and I put the book down on it. But uh, I think you have to put, put a heavy book on top of the scanner to keep it open. Uh, and that's actually a first edition of that book. So I, don't, I, I didn't want to, to break the spine. Um, but The Birth of China was, uh, was published in 1936, and it really caught a moment in time, because in London there was a very famous exposition, the, the Burlington Exposition, that uh, featured Chinese bronze vessels. And it uh, um, was, was the first time, really, that, that Western people, Western uh, sort of museum-going public encountered Chinese antiquities. And they, uh, uh, so Creel's book was published right at the same time and uh, caught that moment. We have other, uh, I, I've heard from any number of people that reading Creel's book, The Birth of China, is what got them interested in Chinese studies in the first place. One of our Maybe, maybe our senior colleague in Chinese studies at the university right now, David Roy, who has just finished his life's work, which is a translation of the Jinping Mei, uh, 
in five volumes. Uh, volume five uh, was just published in, in August. And David spent about 35 years working on that translation. Uh, but he, uh, he has told me any number of times that it was reading Creel's book, The Birth of China, that got him interested in Chinese studies to begin with. Lots of people. It, it's, it's a beautifully written book. Um, it angered a certain number of Chinese scholars because in it he reported on the excavations at Anya before the archaeologists had a chance to write their reports. And there, there's an archaeological, there's a, uh, a protocol in archaeological studies that you're not supposed to talk about things that haven't been reported by the archaeologists. They have the right of first publication. And so they feel that Creel beat them to it on this. Um, I'm not sure that anyone's holding grudges 80 years later. But uh, um, Creel went on, so he began at the university in 1936. He went on to have a very distinguished career. Um, wrote books, uh, Chinese thought from Confucius to Mao Zedong. He wrote a, a biography of Confucius, uh, published in, in 1947, that makes Confucius sound very much like a, a Jeffersonian Democrat somehow. Um, a, he worked on um, Chinese intellectual history, so what is Taoism and other studies. Uh, whoops, I don't have any more. He, uh, he published a book in 1970 called Origins of Statecraft in China, um, which was uh, part of it. It was intended to be a, a major study of Chinese notions of statecraft throughout time. But he then fell in love with the Western Zhou Dynasty, and what was supposed to be the first chapter of his book ended up being a book. It's called Origins of Statecraft in China, Volume 1, The Western Zhou. There was never a Volume 2, because he never got on to it. Um, he, uh, he retired in 1973, and uh, uh, we had a, a bit of a hiatus at the university for a while. And I'll come back to the period 19, after, after Creel um, retired. But I, I should say that uh, Professor Creel also left his estate to the university. So he was a good citizen of the, of the university in that respect. That's what pays for my salary. Uh, in addition to paying my salary, it's also left us a nice sum of money to, uh, uh, to do things like make trips to Beijing to attend conferences for me, but uh, to, to help our students uh, in particular. So uh, Creel uh, has been supremely influential in beginning a program in Chinese studies. He, among other things, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, he brought a, uh, a Chinese scholar to the university in the late 1930s, Deng Siyu. Um, and together, they did a whole series of textbooks uh, of Chinese. Some of the first textbooks that uh, were done in the United States, newspaper Chinese by the inductive method, um, literary Chinese by the inductive method, they were awful. They're really awful textbooks. Nobody, nobody would ever imagine using them now. But um, they, during the war, during World War II, they were one of the training centers for, um, for American uh, military to learn Chinese. Even though Creel was, was, it spent a good deal of time in Washington. He was in, in Army intelligence, uh, actually rose to the rank of colonel in the army during the war. Um, in the uh, 1940s, towards the end of the war, uh, the, once again the Rockefeller Foundation came into uh, uh, to play with respect to the University of Chicago and brought a couple of very distinguished, although 
distinguished. At the time, very young uh, Chinese scholars to the University of Chicago. And these two, Chen Mengjia and Dong Zuobin, are two of the most famous scholars in all of 20th century uh, Chinese uh, scholarship. Uh, Chen Mengjia was, was very when he arrived at Chicago, just 33 years old. Uh, he's the, the guy on the right. Dong Zuobin, a uh, Dong was a, a good friend of Creel's. Chen was at Chicago at a time that Creel, for most of the time, that Creel was not there. Creel didn't get back from Washington until 1946. Um, Ian mentioned the Oriental Institute. The department, the, the program in East Asian Studies, uh, used to be called the program in Far Eastern Studies, was originally part of the Oriental Institute as was our South Asian program. The Oriental, Oriental Institute was originally divided into three tracks, Near Eastern Studies, South Asian Studies, and Far Eastern Studies. Uh, so Chen Mengjia arrived in 1944. Uh, he had the office of uh, uh, Robert Biggs in the Oriental Institute. Number 314 in the OI was the office of Chen Mengjia. Um, Chun came to, uh, to pursue a project. He wanted to catalog all of the bronze vessels in foreign countries. And he started uh, uh, the very first volume, published in 1946, and in the three years that he spent at Chicago, he put together a, uh, a tremendous book. For, for the time, uh, it, it was a stunning book. Uh, it never got published. At least it never got published in the form in which he had written it. Uh, he wrote it in English. He, he, was, uh, he, he was educated in missionary schools. He was a Christian. His wife was uh, uh, the daughter of a, a Chinese Christian minister. Um, Chen Mengjia, for, for those of you who do Chinese studies and early Chinese studies, you certainly know the name Chen Mengjia, one of the most famous intellectuals of all, um, wrote beautiful English. Uh, indeed, his, his correspondence with uh, museums around the Western world, you would never know that he wasn't a native speaker of English. The surprising thing about him is that his Chinese was not quite as good as his English. Um, at, at least his calligraphy. His calligraphy maybe wasn't as good as mine. Um, it, it really, you know, I, I, have, I have various things that Chen wrote, and uh, it looks like a foreigner's handwriting. Uh, very strange. Uh, this is what the, the Oriental Institute looked like a long time ago. Um, and uh, some of you who have been to Chicago and have seen the, the, uh, uh, the reception area of the Oriental, Oriental Institute will recognize this room, their, their most famous piece. It comes, the Oriental Institute has always worked either with Egyptian antiquities or um, things from Iraq, Mesopotamia. And this, of course, comes from Iraq. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that Chen Mengjia did while he was at Chicago, in addition to teaching, teaching classical Chinese, he, uh, he produced the only catalog that the Art Institute of Chicago has ever had of its bronzes. So this is a view of the... Uh, uh, the Chinese Antiquities Room of the Art Institute in the 1930s and 40s. Of course, now it's uh, it's much fancier, but they're still the same the same bronze vessels. They've only bought one new bronze vessel in the last 50 years. Um, so the the catalog remains that of Chen Mengjia. Um, he was actually professor of Chinese art history 
in the 1930s, 40s, and into the 1950s, Ludwig Bachhofer, um, a German guy, and an example of what art history used to be like in the Western world. Bachhofer, of course, didn't read any Chinese at all. And Chun and, and Bachhofer worked very well together, and he said it was a great game because he approached, he being Chun, approached the vessels from the inscription and tried to, tried to understand what the inscription said about the date of the bronze vessel. And Bachhofer couldn't read the inscription, but he would, he would look at the vessel itself and try to, to imagine where it, where it stood in the development of bronze styles. And the two would argue back and forth. And, and Chun found that to be a great challenge to him, that here was somebody who didn't know Chinese and yet was pretty conversant with, uh, with, with Chinese artistic expression. Oops. No. Uh, and this is the, the catalog of the Buckingham Collection at the Art Institute. And so I mentioned we have a collection of oracle bones at the university. The, uh, the collection of bronze vessels at the Art Institute is not particularly large, about 35 or 40 pieces, but each piece is, is just a, almost a masterpiece of a particular style. It's a wonderful collection. And when Kate Buckingham put it together in the 1920s, um, she obviously had people who knew what they were doing buying for her in China, but uh, it, it remains just a, a little jewel of a collection. Uh, so I. If, if you have a chance to go to the Art Institute, it's well worth sticking your head in the Chinese, uh, Chinese galleries. Um, this, is, uh, this is just a picture, not of the University of Chicago. I, does anyone recognize? Dali should recognize that. This was actually um, celebrating the 200th anniversary of the founding of Princeton in 1945, and they had a big, uh, a big symposium on Chinese studies. Uh, we have Hurley Creel, who we've seen up there. Um, that was Chen Meng Jia. He showed up for that. Uh, Bachhofer is in there, right there. This guy, anyone recognize? He was a, a professor at Peking University. Um, Another one of the most famous men in, uh, in 20th century Chinese scholarship, Feng Yulan, um, who was in the States as well. And uh, uh, he was working at the University of Pennsylvania with Dirk Bada doing the translation of his famous book on the history of Chinese philosophy. Uh, so just to, to point out that they were, uh, they were together with uh, scholars this, uh, uh, this building actually was used by Einstein way right. back in the right. Yeah. Right. Every uh, everybody's always always impressed with that that you go in. It, it Einstein's office does not go to the chair of the department at Princeton, but uh, um, yeah. What is it, Jones Hall or yeah? Uh, but the other thing about this picture that uh, um, that I find quite amusing. Uh, of course, we have Feng Yulan and Chen Mengjia, two Chinese scholars. Uh, there's one woman, and all the rest are old white guys. You know? uh, the days of old white guys doing Chinese studies are, are very much in the past, um, which is, I think, a great thing. Uh, Chen's book. Chen's book was published in a very bastardized form in Chinese. And for those of you who can't read the title, it is um, the uh, uh, Our Country's Shang and Zhou Bronzes that the American Imperialists Stole from Us. <laughs> um, Plundered. Huh? Plundered. Plundered, yeah. yeah. Um, this was published in 1962. Uh, the English version, which runs 
about 1,800 pages, was under contract with the Harvard Yenjing Institute. And Chun presented the manuscript to them in 1947, and they never published it. In fact, it was lost until about six or seven years ago when we found it in the archives of the Institute of Archaeology here in Beijing. Um, so, unfortunately, if we were to publish it now, it would be for historical reasons only, because the field has changed so much in the intervening 70 years that it wouldn't make much sense to do it. But, uh, and we couldn't get anyone to pay for a publication such as that. One of the ideas is perhaps just to put it online, um, which maybe I'll do. Uh, and, and I've gotten permission from the Harvard Yenjing Institute to do so. I haven't talked to the Institute of Archaeology yet. Um, this is Chen Meng Jia's wife, um, Jia Luo Rei, who got a PhD from the University of Chicago, um, returned to China in 1949, and uh, uh, became a professor at Peking University. She was the translator of Walt Whitman's poetry. Um, so she, she died in the mid-1990s. She did make one return to, to Chicago in about 1990. Uh, Chun himself, if you saw the, uh, uh, the dates for him, he died in 1966 at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. It was a very unhappy period in China, and particularly for Chun, who from the 1950s on was branded as a rightist. And, and perhaps he was branded as a rightist. I, I want to get back to the University of Chicago in a second, but, um, but giving, giving this talk in China, um, it strikes me as very poignant to, to find a few memos that Chun wrote. One is a talk that he gave at Brent House. Brent House is on Woodlawn, I think between 56th and 57th, um, and he was invited there in 1945, and the, the points on the left are points that he made in, in that talk, just his first year in Chicago, that we should increase the exchange of scholars and students for the study and appreciation of other cultures, internationalize scientific research, so that science should serve peace instead of war, said in 1945. Uh, we should learn at least one foreign language well enough to read, preferably one radically different from one's own. Um, strikes me that that's still a good thing to do. Um, exchange and exhibit art objects, um, travel and study in a foreign country for long periods. Once again, put yourself back um, in 1945 and think about the audacity, the audacity of hope, if we, we draw that uh, uh, statement from, from uh, Ian's old boss, um, and develop friendship with foreigners, liberally exchange opinions. It strikes me as, uh, as, as all things that nowadays we agree to wholeheartedly. Um, he came back to uh, uh, to Beijing. He was a professor at Tsinghua University, and uh, he wanted to establish an art museum at Tsinghua. And he said on the right was a, a memo that he wrote to the president of Tsinghua in 1948. Uh, we should support and encourage research reports from throughout the country, as well as the exchange of materials and exhibitions abroad. He actually suggested that archaeological artifacts should be shared with the whole world. That, of course, is something that, that still today would never be accepted. Um, and we should invite scholars and professors from outside the country and accept foreign students who specialize in Chinese art. Uh, and of course, he was interested not only in Chinese art, but in, in all aspects of Chinese civilization. Um, this got him in trouble. Uh, so. In 1955, he was branded as a rightist, and eventually in 1966, he committed suicide um, in, the, in the courtyard of the Institute of Archaeology. Um, Dong Zuo Bin 
was at Chicago. Uh, just for people who, who are interested in the study of ancient China, uh, a story, Chen and Dong didn't like each other at all. Uh, and they, you know, you've heard these stories of graduate students at places going to the library and checking out books, not that they wanted, but that they knew that somebody else wanted. And the two of them would do that. You know, if, if Chun heard that Dung was working on something, he'd go to the library and get all the books out so that Dung couldn't do the work and, and vice versa. Um, I'm not going to spend as much, I'm not going to spend any time talking about Dung Zobin. Um, but he did spend two years at Chicago. Um, and they, they were important years for him uh, because, because he was in a very unsettled condition at the time. There was no, nothing for him to do in China, uh, so to get out of, of China and do his work. Um, the books. Creel got not a Rockefeller Foundation grant, but a Ford Foundation grant um, in, uh, I think, 1940 or, or so, uh, $400,000 to buy books. And that is where our collection of Chinese books comes from. They really, uh, the, the foundation of the collection was, uh, was formed at that time. Um, I found this, this letter in Creel's archives, dated 1939, by a guy who's T.H. Chen, the business manager of the, the Quarterly Bull Bulletin of Chinese Bibliography, saying that because costs have gone up, we can no longer send you our bulletin gratis. We have to charge you. You're going to be charged one American dollar. Um, uh, but that's not why I wanted to, to feature this, because of the changing economics of Chinese studies. Uh, but rather, T.H. Chen uh, became a student of Creel's. He came to the university in 1947, uh, became the director of the, what was then called the Far Eastern Collection, uh, is now the East Asian Collection. Um, got a PhD from the university, published a book called Written on Bamboo and Silk, published in 1962. Um, and then a, a second edition brought out finally in 2004 uh, with an afterword by Edward L. Shaughnessy, surprisingly enough. Um, and got a letter from your old boss, Barack Obama, uh, four years ago when he turned 100. Professor Chen is still, is still living in Hyde Park at the age of 104 now. Um, he doesn't get around very much anymore, but he's, he's still with us. Uh, he, uh, when did he stop driving? At 99. <laughs> um, and, and I rode with him when he was 98, and it was too, too late. He, he should have given up his license at about, uh, about 85, I think. Um, but uh, just last year, he published a, uh, a book, Collected Writings on Chinese Culture, uh, things that he'd published over the years in English. And then also last, last year, um, Ian showed you the, uh, the Mansueto Library, which uh, if you haven't been back to campus, you should, I, I think, make your first stop on campus because it's an absolutely stunning building. Um, but to, uh, to celebrate the opening of the library and to celebrate um, Professor Chen, uh, a, a major international conference last year called Texting China, and Composition, Transmission, and Preservation of Pre-Modern Chinese Textual Materials, particularly preservation. And we have launched a program with the National Library of China to, um, uh, to train Western conservators 
and the techniques of preserving Chinese books. And we also have, have a, a program with the National Library of China to digitize all the rare books, all the rare Chinese books. In, in our collection, indeed, it's, it's a, a union uh, effort being done for all the rare books in, in North America. Uh, um, moving forward, and I want to move more quickly, I think. I know. I, I noticed that uh, uh, when I was looking at this, the, the, the paper version of this today, 1912. It was actually 2012, um, uh, just after the Texting China Conference. In June of last year, Professor He, uh, he Bingdi passed away at the age of 95. Um, so, apparently, people doing Chinese studies uh, find a, a, some sort of methods of longevity. And Chicago, and, I guess at Chicago, yeah. Um, he Bingdi was was originally a, a scholar of later imperial Chinese institutional history. Uh, he so uh, another little bit of gossip about the field. He hated Creole. Um, hated Creole with a passion, and uh, and felt that one of the problems was that Creole. Well, no, I won't. I won't go there. But uh, but when Creole published his book, Origins of Chinese Civilization, or Origins of Statecraft in China, in 1970, He took it as a personal affront, and decided that he could do a much better job studying ancient Chinese history. And so he, he switched from Ming Qing history to ancient Chinese history and, and wrote The Cradle of the East, which was published. It says Chinese University of Hong Kong and the University of Chicago Press. Actually, the University of Chicago Press refused it and refused it. Um, and, and it was actually published by the, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, but He went to the president's office and demanded that the University of Chicago put its imprimatur on the book. And they did. Um, and it, it's actually a, quite an interesting book. He was, uh, uh, was a wonderful scholar in many ways, um, a difficult man in other ways. But, uh, um, but Creel was a difficult man, too. Uh, so the, the blame is not all with, with Professor He. Um, he uh, he retired in 1985 from the history department. Um, so uh, he his book was published in what we often call the golden age of Chinese archaeology, the 1970s, the the time when the terracotta warriors were discovered near the tomb of the first emperor. Um, in the very same year that the terracotta warriors were discovered, um, three tombs in Changsha were unearthed. These are the Ma Wangdui tombs, um, including this perfectly preserved body of the first lady Dai. Um, so she died uh, in about 170 BC. And when they uh, opened the tomb, her body was, was perfectly preserved. They actually uh, performed an autopsy on her and found out what her last meal was. Um, and, uh, and do I have, yes. Uh, a year later, the tomb, the third of the three tombs at Ma uh, was opened. It was the tomb of her son, and in it was a veritable library of books. He, he died in 168 B.C., um, including the Yi Jing, which is one of the, the fields that I'm supposed to work in, um, and also the Lao Tzu, the Dao De Jing, uh, that uh, was very quickly edited and published because there's a group of, of four scholars who were brought together in what used to be called the Hong Lao, the uh, Institute of uh, or the Bureau of Culture, uh, just behind the Forbidden City, and uh, they were taken there 
and they were told that they were the editorial team for the Ma Wong Dui documents, and they had to work on the Lao Tzu first because someone on high was particularly interested in it. And they, they were never told who that someone on high was, but uh, they, they sort of figured. And they got it out in 1975, a year before that someone on high died. Uh, so Mao Zedong did have a chance to read the, uh, the Ma Wong Dui manuscripts of the, uh, of the Lao Tzu. Um, and then back in Anyang, uh, in 1975, uh, the tomb of the queen of the king whose uh, oracle bone I displayed at the very beginning of the talk was unearthed. And surprisingly enough, it's the only um, elite tomb at Anyang that hadn't been burgled. So it was opened up and uh, just stunning bronze vessels, jade pieces, uh, a wealth of antiquities found in the tomb. So those are just three of the, the uh, uh, archaeological discoveries of the 1970s. There, there are scores more that we, we look back at. We thought at the time this was the golden age. And we, in some ways, we, we say the new study of ancient China began in the 1970s. Little did we know what was going to be found in, in later decades, the golden age didn't just last the, the 10 years of the 1970s. It's still going on. Oh, and this was discovered, uh, not usually considered one of the, the great discoveries of the 1970s, though it's, um, it's uh, something that's dear to me because it's on the cover of my first book, um, a, a bronze inscription that in some ways is the earliest historical account in Chinese history goes through a reign by reign listing of kings and what they did uh, on whoops uh, the right hand side uh, mentions the first six kings of the Western Zhou dynasty and what they did and the left hand side mentions the first six generations of the scribes ancestors and how they served the Zhou kings oops this way. And uh, now to come back to the University of Chicago a little bit, um, there was a, another exhibition similar to the, the 1936 Burlington Exposition in London, that this was called the Great Bronze Age of China Exhibition in 1980. And the first time that antiquities from mainland China came to the United States. And it was also the first time that we had a scholarly conference that included scholars from mainland China. So think of this, 19, 1980, um, Deng Xiaoping, uh, so America recognized China at the end of 1978. Deng Xiaoping just announces the opening uh, to the world. Um, in 1980, June of 1980, there was a conference at the Metropolitan Museum of New York, and then another at Berkeley. And four of the, the most important scholars of late 20th century China. Um, OK, I will do it. Uh, this is Xianai, who was the director of the Institute of Archaeology. Um, Zhang Zhenglang, just died a couple of years ago, uh, grand old man of the field. Ma Chengyuan, who was the director of the Shanghai Museum uh, and built the Shanghai Museum there at Renmin Guangchang in, in Shanghai, and Zhang Changshou. And I didn't always have white hair. I have this picture because I'm in it. Uh, I, was, I was their interpreter. Um, and this is, I was actually giving a talk at Anyang in 1984. So I said that that bronze vessels on the cover of my first book. I was appointed to the, uh, to the faculty in 1984. Um, enough said. It's been a long time since, uh, actually it hasn't been that long. It seems like not quite just yesterday, but. Uh, um, early China studies, for 10 years or so, I was 
the only person who did early China studies at the university. Um, in 1993, we added a second professor, uh, Wu Hong, in the art history department, who at that time worked primarily on ancient China. Um, now he works on everything, the whole range of Chinese artistic expression from uh, Neolithic pottery down through the most avant-garde uh, uh, performance art that's done in China. Um, and since I only have three minutes now, I won't even talk about this, but in, 19, uh, in the 1990s, I, uh, I edited the Cambridge History of Ancient China, uh, which still serves as a kind of uh, uh, major, major work on ancient China. Um, and we'll just skip that. Uh, and we'll skip that. 1999, uh, we added a third scholar who works on ancient China. And this is Don Harper. Um, who is the director of the Center for East Asian Studies, um, having succeeded Dali in that capacity. Um, and he works on uh, Chinese, Chinese history of science, um, manuscript studies, various religion and things like that. Um, but then Ian started to say that there, there was a provostial um, initiative uh, announced about two years ago to add five new lines in Chinese studies. In addition to those five new, new lines in Chinese studies, the university ac actually, um, apart from those lines, has appointed two university professors. That's the highest rank that you can have at the University of Chicago. Um, and, and indeed, you can't get promoted to that rank from within. It's, it's a recruiting device that they have. Um, once you make distinguished service professor, you're finished. You're, uh, you've gone as high as you can go. But the two people that uh, uh, were appointed, Han Saucy, who works on comparative literature, but also has a real interest in ancient Chinese literature, uh, started two years ago. And then just last year, Ken Pomerantz, uh, who doesn't work on traditional China, but Ming, Qing, and, and contemporary Chinese history uh, is in the, in the history department. Um, a bit earlier, working on religion, we have Paul Kopp, who wasn't just appointed, but he was just tenured uh, last December. So that's something to celebrate on the left there. He's in East Asian language and civilizations working on Buddhism. And Brooke Zipporin is one of those provostial appointments um, in the Divinity School. He too works on, on Buddhism, though he also has an interest, for instance, in the Zhuangzi. Um, so uh, Brooke is just joining us this term. And then this was supposed to be a talk on archaeological discoveries for years. Other than Wu Hong, who worked with archaeology, I, I did a little bit with archaeology, but neither, neither Wu Hong nor I is an archaeologist in any, in any way at all. Uh, so we didn't have any trained archaeologist on the faculty. Um, as part of the provostial initiative, I uh, proposed a position in East Asian languages on archaeology, and I'm happy to say that it was approved. Of course, getting it approved by the provost is just the first step. Then you have to identify the proper person. Um, we had three people on our short list. Um, Alice, who is a, an alumna of the university, uh, though she went to Michigan to do her PhD, and then was teaching at the University of Toronto in Canada, was on our short list but we didn't hire her. She wasn't the right fit for East Asian languages. We hired uh, Li Yongdi from Academia Sinica in Taiwan, um, and he's coming today. Uh, September the 23rd 
his flight is due to arrive in Chicago just in time to teach next week. Um, and he works on Anyang, among other things. His major, his major interest is on uh, handicraft uh, factories in Anyang. But at the same time that we were running this search in Chinese archaeology, and we were looking for someone in Chinese historical archaeology, the anthropology department. And Judy Farquhar, who spoke here just five days ago, was chair of anthropology. Uh, they were looking for someone in just historical archaeology of any part of the world. On their short list was also Alice. She made two trips to Chicago that winter, and anthropology ended up hiring her. She was on campus last year. So we have now gone from zero representation of Chinese archaeology to two full-fledged Chinese archaeologists. Alice works in Yunnan um, with, the, uh, with the Dian culture from the Han Dynasty. Um, so the, the, the field of early China studies at the University of Chicago is, is really blossoming right now. Um, from the days when I was the only person, so I had to teach everything from not quite Yao to Mao, but uh, um, the, the entire run of Chinese history down to the Song Dynasty. Now I can just focus on this analytical dictionary of, of uh, ancient China that still will never get written. But, uh, um, but anyways, there's, there's a great deal happening on campus. Um, Ian introduced you to the, the kind of physical things and also the, uh, the institutional framework within which this is all happening. Um, for, for the center in Beijing, you know, this, is, this is a center for the University of Chicago. It's not our Chinese studies center at all. And yet it provides a, a, a very rich resource for those of us who do Chinese studies. And indeed, Yongdi said that one of the reasons that he accepted our offer was because of the availability of the center in Beijing to, to do um, exchange programs with Chinese archaeologists and to have conferences here. So um, I, I expect that I, I will be back uh, once or twice in, in the, the coming years. So that is um, whatever the talk was supposed to be called, the rebirth of early China. Um, and we've had uh, about 80 years of Chinese studies going on at the university. And I think we have, we have a bright future to look, look forward to. Thank you very much.